evening. Welcome to the Cognitive Rampage. I'm your host, Adam Lowry, as usual. Um, sorry for the little long music introduction there, uh, taking care of a few things before we got started. But um, hope everybody's doing well. Um, uh, I'm recently back on uh, social media, uh, and uh, I've had a long absence for quite a while. Uh, but uh, reemerged. Uh, those of you that uh, have left a few comments on the uh, FBI profile shot, um, that was just a joke for one. Um, but um, I appreciate it. it's been uh, really good connecting with some old friends I haven't spoke to in a while, or at least text to in a while. Uh, but um, uh, it, it's been good reconnecting, and uh, I, I hope uh, some people have been browsing around. Obviously, I see the videos getting watched, but. Uh, I, I hope more or less you're taking some of the things that we talk about in the show, uh, implementing them in your own life. Uh, if anything, what we aim to do here at the show is uh, just get your wheels turning, you know, thinking about life a little differently even. Uh, but that's what we try to do. Uh, we really don't have set topics that we discuss on the show here on the Rampage, uh, but um, we just kind of see where we travel down the rabbit hole as you see me posted there. But um, those of you that do know, uh, October 18th, um, here, uh, not this Saturday, but next Saturday, uh, here in Naples, uh, at the Holiday Inn uh, at 3210 Tamiami Trail. You can see the uh, flyer there posted on the website. Uh, I was in the uh, the ad actually did an article on me. The Coastal Breeze. Thank you very much, Coastal Breeze, uh, and Noel uh, and everyone there at the paper uh, did a uh, wonderful write up on the on the rampage on the event that's coming. So thank you to them. Um, anyway, uh, that will be Saturday the 18th. Uh, it starts at 10 o'clock. Um, I won't be speaking until 11. Uh, I'll be laying out uh, some uh, food, some breakfast, coffee, juice, etc. Uh, for people to enjoy uh, for about an hour or so before I get the talk going. Uh, for those of you that are coming, I've been getting a few emails um, asking me if they should bring anything. Uh, I will have um, folders there for you uh, to use so you can write. Uh, but if you have a, a certain folder you're already working out of or a comfortable thing you like to write on, uh, I would suggest bringing that. Um, please bring that uh, if you want to follow with some notes or just listen. Uh, the visual uh, image or the audio imagery can or the audio impact can be just as powerful. So um, I'm trying to answer some of the emails here. Um, let's see. Um, it's free. Yeah, there's a couple costs. So no, there's no cost at all uh, for the talk. Uh, there will be a workshop afterwards to where you can work with uh, me one on one but in a group setting. Uh, so I'll be doing a workshop afterwards to discuss a little more in depth to help you personalize some of the things I'll be teaching you how to do. Um, uh, so the workshop will come after, but look forward to a lot more rampages coming up, uh, live talk rampages that is. Uh, we probably will be speaking every Saturday uh, on different topics. Uh, we'll be talking about relationships, I'll be talking about my cognitive rampage approach. Uh, I'll have guests with me joining me as well to talk. Um, but uh, we, I'm excited about a lot of shows that are coming up, uh, a lot of new guests that will be appearing on the Cognitive Rampage show. Um, you saw uh, Susan and Steve Brenner last week, uh, just an amazing power couple, if you will, uh, her being a, a therapist and um, him being an environmental engineer turned uh, kayak guide. It was, it was good to get to know them uh, last week, but we'll see some new guests starting to come through here or whatever. Uh, you all know uh, Leo. Uh, I may have a few faces, or uh, actually, I know there's a few new faces or eyes joining us tonight. Um, for those of you that don't know, uh, Leo Dianaval, who's joining me tonight, uh, is a primary, is my primary mentor. Um, he has a lot to do with um, the cognitive rampage approach, um, and more than all the accolades and research and all these certificates on the wall that that back up what he can do. Uh, He's a good man, uh, and he's a friend of mine. So, uh, any I enjoy talking to him, and that our conversations actually, uh, yeah, please come on in, man. Yeah, you don't have to wait on me. Uh, our conversations actually, I was telling, you know, started, you know, based on us just talking, you know, just sitting outside and talking, and, and I thought, you know, we were covering so much information that I thought to myself that, you know, we, we you know, we, we got to get this involved, you know, and talk to people. It makes it interesting. Oh, I did leave something out. Those of you that didn't notice, um, please feel free to interact during the show. I have my wonderful phone here. Um, so if you're watching live and uh, you want to participate in the conversation, uh, just tweet uh, on my show at uh, Adam's Rampage, uh, and I'll be happy to include you in the conversation. So um, I just had to let them know that's a new feature that we're bringing in. Yeah, I like that. Good. Yeah, tweet. But those conversations, man, we used to sit out front, you know, and, and, and just talk and talk and, 
sometimes forget we had to go back and work. Right. But, you know, we, we used to travel down, or we still do, you know, walk down so many different rabbit holes. And, you know, I was talking today to uh, some clients about, um, you know, mentors. And sometimes I think people get the notion that when you have a mentor that it becomes this um, young Jedi kind of thing to where it's like whatever you say, master. Mm -hmm. And I was talking with these clients today about how, no, you know, having a mentor is someone that, you listen to someone that can advise you, someone you're wired like, mm -hmm. um, but it's also someone that can challenge you, but you can challenge back. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's the whole part is to inspire thinking. I mean, uh, mentor, yeah, a lot of the concepts that we've talked about, um, you know, sort of found its way into our theoretical perspective. But what's interesting is uh, your life experience, where you take that. And um, when you listen to anyone, you have your own frame of reference. and but it stimulates thought, and from that is where growth, you know, that's where comes it comes from. from. And can we so. shut the fan off? And I'm, I'm worried maybe that fan yeah, may sure. cause some some sound. Man. I'm yeah. sorry, but you know, you talk about that word growth and, yeah. and and how we, you know, a lot of people we hear it. There's words that get overused all the time. Yeah. You know, empowerment, growth, enlightenment. You know, all these fun words right. that people use. Hell, I play with them. Yeah. But I mean, the, the words are there to play with. But I, I mean, what do we mean really when we say cultivating growth? Well, it's, you know, if you continue to think in the same ways and don't challenge your thought processes, um, it, you sort of stagnate, you get complacent. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it just becomes what is. But there's something beyond that. I mean, every time you develop a, an idea, you know, to challenge that, there's a, the other side of the idea that um, as a result of that challenge and the new thought, you know, that's where the growth springs. Mm -hmm. Because had I not thought about it that way, um, I never would have entered this whole new plateau of, well, if that's true, then this could be true. And if that's true, then... When you spoke about it, I almost, in my mind, I thought about, um, you know, almost an adolescent. That mm -hmm. where, you know, there's this one time in their life to where they've decided that they know it all. They can't be told anything. They get it. The favorite response is, I know. Right. And when you mentioned the word stagnate, it made me think about that. How many people are in their 30s and their 40s, etc. on up? Uh, even younger too, but have been stagnated almost in this teenage, young adult, adolescent mind frame when they've decided that what they believe is what is, right. and there's no room for change. When when the beliefs have become so concrete that they their favorite line becomes, "That's just who I am." Right. Yeah. No, that happens, and um, and what happens, which even even more sad actually, is they start to feel like then what they think defines their value. And so if you challenge them on an issue, you're not just challenging them on the topic at hand. Uh, if you don't agree with them, at some level they're feeling devalued. And, and that's where they, they you gotta get go, defensive. Go more about that because, you know, I, I've gotten some emails about us mm -hmm. um, that, you know, we talk so often that sometimes we, we can volley back and forth without finishing thoughts. Mm -hmm. And some people have told me, like, I don't know what the fuck you just said. <laughs> you know, so I want to... I must be talking about you. Probably me. <laughs> Definitely me. I, I, I feed them with a fire hose. But, you know, I, I want to go back to that point that not to skip over so fast because a lot of people don't understand that notion about um, not defining our worth based on performance. Yeah. I mean, a lot of... You'll find that in relationships. You'll find that in um, on your job sites, everywhere else. You know, a lot of people... It's this culture, man. Yeah, well, you define yourself based on what you do mm -hmm. and what you think. Um, and rather than... Then rather who you are. Rather than what you perform. Well, the performance aspect of it is is an extension well, of your own belief system. I think what we're, what we're both saying the same thing is that in this today's society, we define ourselves based on our performance. Oh, yeah. And that's what we're saying not to do. And how, how, much, how many wants we can get. You know, our, right. our stuff, like we were talking about before with George right. Carlin. Uh, if you have more stuff, then you're more successful. But yeah, and you know, you sort of get locked into, and you live your life based on that belief system. Right. So then someone comes along and disagrees with you. Well, either they're right and I'm wrong, which means I've lived my life on the wrong premise, mm -hmm. or you have to be wrong. As opposed to just seeing that, well, wait a minute, maybe this is just another way of looking at things. And if you can actually be vulnerable enough, uh, humble enough to know that I don't know it all, mm -hmm. and maybe someone else actually does have a better perspective, or, or maybe there's another way of doing this. Or could add thinking. to my own. Yeah, or, or it could reinforce what I'm already thinking. Right. right. But if you're open to other people's 
ideas, perspectives, beliefs. Uh, it's it's something that allows you to still use your own wisdom, your own sense of who you are, mm -hmm. you know, your, your truth, in other words, right? but embellish on it. That means where you can start seeing that, uh, well, I never looked at it that way. And, um, and that unlocks something that allows that growth to take place. So you have to unlock that part where it's just so fixed mm. because... Um, that concrete belief of, about life, about people, about relationships. Yeah, it has to be fluid. It has to flow. It has to change. And, you know, for some people, you know, that may be sitting, listening or, or whatever, mm. even clients when I start talking to them yeah. and I talk about this notion of concrete beliefs, right? Oh, yeah. You know, that yeah. I say that... A lot of that you know, on. You know, our beliefs come from what we experience. Yeah. And yeah. so, you know, okay, so you've experienced it 10 out of 10 times, so you believe it to be fact in your mind. Right. And, I, and I give my roller coaster advice or example where I say, look, you ride the roller coaster, it's the scariest yeah. fucking thing you ever rode. I ride it, I tell you it ain't shit. Who's telling the truth? Right. All right, so our truths are, are, have plasticity. They can be molded and moved. But so many times people just assume or pull from it that, no, no, I know this to be true. You know, I, I know this to be fact, even though they know that truth can be vague and is based on perception. Well, and you said earlier, I mean, everyone's wired has their own wiring, hmm. you know, based on their experience, uh, how they were raised, where they grew up, right. what culture they were in. Um, and that, everyone wants to believe that they had the right idea about that. Mm -hmm. And so... Sure. Humans don't want to be wrong. No, and they don't like change because now I got it locked in and I got it. And so I've pretty much tailored my life based on that belief system. So don't be coming along and telling me like there's a better way to have done it this all the, all the time. Right. Because I like, and so I've been spinning my wheels in ways that I didn't need to. So they get defensive. Uh, sure. And, but if you just sort of know that um, there is no right or wrong way, is it, there's just a different way. Mm -hmm. And if you open yourself up to those differences, I mean, that's allows you to get past that difficulty, you know, where the changes, mm -hmm. because, because I'm open to that, um, it allows me to, to, to tap into what I know to be true and add to it with an additional belief that I would have never considered had I not talked to this other person. Mm. Um, Why are people so reluctant, you think? to give up the belief or the change or, well, I mean, say, why, why do pe some people, and I'm generalizing, yeah. seem to be resistant to change or to the change of, of one's beliefs or, I mean, why do we hold those beliefs to be so close or almost define us? Uh, well, it's like anything else at the unknown. You know, you're, you're, there's, there's comfort and complacency. Mm -hmm. You know, if you uh, have always thought of this way and all of my coping skills, all of my defense mechanisms are set up to this way of viewing the world. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're asking me to look at it another way, I feel very vulnerable because I don't know how to live in that world. Sure. Uh, I have to, have to acquire new skills. I have to, to, to feel competent again, to move beyond that point. Um, it takes its work. I mean, I actually have to, to give this thought and, and, and to give myself the opportunity to move forward and still preserve myself in the process. Sure. So it's easier to stay in my fixed beliefs because I'm already wired and set up for that. But now you've you've just changed the game, and uh, which means now I need new rules, I need defense mechanisms, and so. Well, you you spoke a little while ago about this. You know, I've got this, and I you know I, I talk about that as being this notion that I have arrived, or even that we think we're going to reach this point of. There, I have arrived. Right. And, and that's false. Th there is no I have arrived to a point. If you ask me if you believe you have arrived, you've already died. Yeah. You're done learning. You're done growing. If, we, if we've concreted the arrival, right. then, then what else are we exploring? No, there's no outcome. Mm. I mean, you're, you know, people talk about, you know, they worry about the outcomes. Sure. But the outcomes are ongoing. You know, I live this process. And I achieve what I thought might this out you know, this outcome would be, mm -hmm. but when I get there, I realize now there's another potential outcome, and then another potential. And so all I can do, all you have control over, is the choice you're making in the moment, because the future doesn't exist, and neither does the past anymore. So if I live in that moment and keep making choices compatible with my belief system, uh, then whatever process that I'm living is going to lead me in a direction where the outcome where I need to be. Mm. But once I hit that, because of all the wisdom that I've obtained through that process, now I see beyond that there's something else beyond. And so every time I get there, there's more beyond. And the only way you stop having outcomes is you stop living. Mm. Um, but some people stop living before they die. 
Okay, those are the people that decided, okay, this is the outcome, that's the way it is, this is where I stay. And those are the same people that do the same things day in, day out. They get into that routine, they go to work, they come home, they watch the same television shows, they go to bed, and they go back to work. Mm -hmm. uh, well, that's my outcome, and yeah, this is where I, I got to. Sure. And uh, after a while... And there can be happiness in the simplicity of that. Or they become comfortable in an uncomfortable way. Sure. Sure. And uh, that's the complacency. Yes. And that's why to push them beyond that. It's like, whoa, you know, that I don't know what's out there. And that's mm -hmm. where the anxiety comes in of the unknown. Yeah. Uh, so anxiety sort of, that fear is what keeps us locked. Mm. And to, to get past the fear of knowing that there's more than I know right now. Right. Like there's, there's actually things I could know that may challenge what I already believe. I mean, that's scary to people. Oh yeah, that then because now I no longer feel confident, right? I no longer and, feel confident. In any exchange of any conversation, from the smallest level, the most sophisticated, to the most religious, to the most right. heartfelt, no matter the conversation, it's an exchange of beliefs going on. And uh, you know, it, it's sensitive, classified material. I mean, even if it's, I mean, this is why talks about who's the best college football team of all time can turn into the biggest fight right. because well, it's Ohio State. Uh, University of Miami, for you. But outside of that, I mean, <laughs> but see how the, the moments, the, the smallest exchange of a belief can lead to that urgency, that argument, that challenge, that you've now challenged what I know to be true, thus right. maybe taking taking a shot at my value. Right. I mean, so I think if we can be aware that in any exchange, it's an exchange of classified information because it's beliefs that I'm sharing that if you don't respect or allow me to maintain without guilt, uh, then we're going to have a problem. Well, it goes back to if you don't agree with me, you're devaluing what it is I believe. Mm. And um, I mean, how many wars have been fought over uh, the intolerance of someone else's belief, how the intolerance of are, someone else's religion? How many wars are, are being, being fought? fought. Yeah, absolutely. Right and, now. And they demonize the difference. I mean, either you're me or you're you, and if you don't think like me, then you're wrong. So therefore, I'm entitled to make you think what I think. Right. And, uh, and the other person is saying the same thing in reverse. Right. Uh, and that, I mean, it's, it's been there since the beginning of time. And you uh, can see this online, too. I mean, when you just wa watch people's interactions and conversations and comments back and forth, yeah. I, I think what's good about that part of it is you really can look back and be an analyzer of thought and word. And I look at certain people's conversations, comments, and interactions, and sometimes on random just feeds. Mm -hmm. And you watch it evolve to where you'll see someone reveal a top secret belief, and then someone that challenges someone else's belief. And you watch the people get devalued as they begin to exchange each other's beliefs and degrade each other's beliefs. It gets worse and worse. And all that hurt and fear builds right up to all this anger back and forth. Right. When essentially what they're saying is, how come you're not wired like me? Why haven't you experienced life like me? Therefore, believe like me. And since you don't, you're challenging or threatening me. Right. I mean, that's a sum up of what we've been discussing, right? I mean, so, yeah, I mean, that's, that's the whole thing about growth. When, um, when you can admit that you may be right about me being wrong, right. that's when growth starts to take place. Mm -hmm. Because what you've done is you lowered the drawbridge. Yeah. And uh, I'm going to let this person in. Uh, we're still a little skeptical about this whole thing, but let me take the time to understand it. And it, with understanding, the minute you're willing to understand any concept, you've opened yourself up to growth. Mm. Uh, but with that, that vulnerability, that humility and vulnerability, yeah, I talk absolutely. about walking the fine line between enthusiasm and humility. That if I'm walking a tightrope, and on the one side is the wind of enthusiasm pushing me this way, but the wind of, of humility pushing me this way keeps me balanced on this tightrope, you know? Exactly. And my rational thinking keeps me balanced. Well, and by allowing yourself to understand... Um, keeps me moving forward, so. Well, either it reinforces what I already believe, mm -hmm. or I learn something else that adds to my own understanding of the whole human experience. Mm. So, there's nothing to lose. I, I mean, either... It reinforces. Sure. I don't agree with that. I feel better even now about even more about where I'm at after hearing what you said. Or whoa, that that's interesting. Maybe I uh, I need to add another part. You know, it's like these little Legos, these uh, cognitive Legos that you're adding on. Mm -hmm. You know, this actually it actually looks good stuck on there. 
you know, or like, whoa, that screws up the symmetry, get it out of there. Uh, but whatever it is, um, if you don't open up to understanding and try it on and see what it <laughs> feels like to think that way, um, then you're, you're sort of encased in your own belief system. Mm. And uh, even though it's, it's what, living in your own bubble, right? And he's in his own world. Well, and, to, and to be in control then of how you need to feel emotionally, intellectually, cognitively, you have to put yourself in total isolation. Mm. Uh, and then you're existing, but there's no growth. And uh, in some ways, that's when you start to uh, hence stagnate. Why, hence yeah. why a lot of borderlines are alone <laughs> yeah. in the long run. Well, it's it, uh, <laughs> so if you're alone out there and you're the world. common denominator, it may be you. But uh, just being blunt, you know, we we talked briefly. I'm going to go back uh, about how people can connect in in vulnerabilities. That's that's we we've discussed that before. You know, and it's when you look at how people first meet each other, where it's whether it's two people meeting for friends right. or it's two people meeting for a potential date relationship. It seems that people do their best to hide the vulnerabilities and present this fake book impression when truly that's the worst way to connect with somebody, to really connect with somebody. When connecting with people happens through fear and sharing the vulnerabilities. So if I am truly in it for a real connection, shouldn't I display my vulnerabilities to a point, not weaknesses to where I can be taken advantage of, but sharing certain vulnerabilities and fears with someone in order to connect with them on a deeper level. Well, it goes back to your own defenses, though. Uh, to share vulnerabilities, um, if you're not dealing with someone that can relate, mm -hmm. that's why you're different. In other words, if you're dealing with a predator and you're sharing vulnerabilities, you're making this real easy for them. Right. Uh, so that's where, the, you well, know. We don't want to overshare the vulnerabilities. I'm, I'm kind of 50,000 foot viewing. Right. The initial relationship and its uh, intent. But what they're doing is sort of feeling around if this person has the potential to be trusted. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, you know, knowing I have vulnerabilities and before this has long-term potential, I have to actually know what this person's faults are. But if I find out even in that early stage, what I call that job interview, um, if I'm picking up on things that uh, even though I'm, I'm staying pretty well protected, mm -hmm. there's red flags going off that this is someone that I don't feel comfortable with, someone I don't, I don't think has the potential of being trusted, yeah. or they're putting off signals that uh, I don't particularly want to connect with this person and share that vulnerability. Because when I do share it, I want to share it under the umbrella of trust, because then the relationship could grow. And, and with those vulnerabilities, you share vulnerabilities. Prior to that, um, you're sort of putting yourself out there in a way that um, you're, you have to be very confident before you can bring those vulnerabilities out. Mm. Uh, and confident, not in trusting the other person, but trusting yourself to understand who that other person is. Mm. Or how much of that is the image that I need to put off at first? So you think me to be strong at first, and then I'll slowly leak who I really am. Well, it's sort of like, why wouldn't we be who we really are from the forefront why do we do the job interview because and then leak ourselves out who we really are slowly, knowing that impedes the connection and only makes the bad choice, if it is one, in a relationship longer? Okay, well, you get people that are cynical after a while. They'll just lay it right out there. Okay, these are my faults. You okay with it? No? Okay, bye. Uh, because sure. I don't want to waste any time. And now what's wrong with going too far? Well, in a sense then you've already determined that value. I'm not going to have a relationship, mm. you know, so I'm, you know, this way I'm actually supporting my contention that I'm not compatible with anyone by putting it out there with a pre disposed understanding that they're not going to like who I am. So let me show them up front and they leave and then they verify my own belief system Ooh. that I'm not likable. So, all right, we, we, but, whoa, whoa, <laughs> I'm listening out there. I hear you. Even I was like, hold on. <laughs> All right. So to the people that go, hello, nice to meet you, verbally diarrhea their problems. Here are my faults, my weaknesses, and what I've been through. Now you see it all. Those that do it immediate right. are doing that because? Self-fulfilling prophecy. Okay. In other words, they already think that no one's going to want to be with them. 
but they would rather that relationship never develop as a result of their being control as to why than actually put themselves out there and it not work. Okay. So in other words, I can blame myself for screwing it up, mm -hmm. but if I give it my best shot and then you don't want me, then I'm annihilated. Okay. So the safest way, and that's why people function is let me see how your job interview looks. And, you know, uh, let me see if I actually enjoy you when you're being superficial. Mm. Okay. And if that seems to be pretty good, and that's where I move into that second phase. Does, is this starting to satisfy my needs once that job interview's over? Disagreements, don't get along, job interview's gone. So now we're sitting there and it's like, yeah, I think this person un understands me, that we connect on a level that makes sense. So they are satisfying my needs in that relationship. Mm -hmm. But then the next step is, do I truly know what their faults are? And that's where it comes in. Uh, everyone's gonna have faults, but if there are any intolerable faults, because there's, if there's even one intolerable fault, that's going to cause resentment. Resentment's going to erode away emotion that things unravel. And how many times are the intolerables look, looked over, you know, based on a rationalization of, you know, what's really happening? The job interview. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. People fall in love on a job interview. And they're not really falling in love with the person. They're falling in love with how that person makes them feel without even knowing who they are. And that's why when things start to change, they keep trying to get back to that person they first knew. Mm -hmm. When in reality, the person that actually exists is the person I've known the last three months. The person I fell in love with was on a job interview. I fell in love with the potential of the relationship, not even really knowing the reality. And now that I know the reality, if, if, if I knew everything at that point, right up front, I never would even date that guy. So, so. so where's the fine line between going uh, so do we suggest the job interview route to, to the approach or we, we already discussed not to let's throw out all the garbage at once yeah, not do that. So where's the fine line between going? I want to make sure I don't put on too much of a job interview here And I am who I am so I can allow for a true connection with the person given that they're not too much on the job interview which I could discover by displaying some vulnerabilities and fears which they could as well without verbally diarying my entire right. Uh, right. issue, yeah. right? And so slowly, I mean, when you look at relationships and trying to define the approach, I mean, it's a no wonder that, I mean, it's some of the toughest things to operate in life. But this assessment works after doing it for 30 years. Um, and well, it I does. It, it, I didn't want you to give away your five-step assessment. I don't want you to give away your five-step assessment, though. But that's why. What's very off. cool about it, though, is. Um, it, it's, it's about you then. You can be as genuine as you want mm -hmm. in, on your job interview, but not everyone's going to be like you. Right. So, and that gives you a chance to, to understand how much I'm picking up that I actually believe is genuine. Yeah. But I don't know for sure. You know, and I'm not going to know for probably, if you see each other regularly, maybe three months. Mm -hmm. uh, but little by little then, you know, uh, this, you're, you're very intuitive and you have a chance to to see the, the, the non-verbals, the nuances, what they're doing when you don't even know they're looking. I mean, yeah. you start to understand the person. Um, but so many people don't wait because there are, a lot of people are in love with the idea of being in love. And so, sure, sure. you know, they, that, they don't really want to believe that there's more there than what they're seeing. Uh, and they don't want to take the time. But if you follow that, this assessment, then, uh, it takes the anxiety out. I mean, you can actually, it's not a matter of trusting other people, just a matter of trusting yourself to do well, this. this. This seems like the perfect time to, to plug. So um, you can find Leo at truthnotemotion.com. Um, his five-step assessment is on his website that you can listen to. Um, and, you know, you can all, all obviously book Leo, talk to him, and, and work through him. He also has his own show, Truth Not Emotion, which airs after this show. Uh, but... Um, Definitely check out the five-step assessment. Um, and those work. You'll, you'll like it. <laughs> hey, we, we all need to find the right relationship if we already haven't got it. Uh, and, and but we all also need to be learning how to master that what we have. Um, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of left turn here. I was I've been thinking about someone who's going going through some things, and um, this person is sitting in in quite a dilemma. You know, in their life and. This person is has done wonders 
and almost a complete 180 in their life about what and, and mentally um, it's just amazing to see the growth that has happened and we all understand that we know that you know we're human and we'll make some mistakes even as we're making our abrupt or our about face or our turnaround and sometimes we get caught in a situation where we fall off that horse that we were riding so quickly um, and are quick to continue to make decisions of that era if you will um, to where since I've fallen once we use that as the excuse to continue to fall but this fall this time has placed this person in a moral situation to where choosing one thing is for the morals and a religious basis while the other option is keeps her more in a uh, a desired place socially uh, socioeconomically speaking um, about where they are at in their life and how does somebody begin to make that proper decision when they're faced with the moral dilemmas of moral beliefs and religious foundations versus possible logistical decisions quality of life decisions for already existing people that they provide to and continue to find themselves and, and back on the horse I mean it, it's a struggle to be in that situation well I mean when you're talking about your your own moral compass mm -hmm. and your own belief system be it spiritual religious whatever um, to pretend that that's less important than the logistic or the, or the ones that you're trying to maintain um, it's sort of a formula for disaster because um, but what if the moral choice logistically could be a socio-economic disaster and relationship disaster with those that already exist well all you can be is who you are mm -hmm. either the situation is going to accept you for who you are or they're accepting the person you're pretending to be mm -hmm. so what's the point uh, you know you just have to you know people have to put out there that you know maybe this is how I need to think maybe this isn't how I need to think but this this is it this, this is me this is this is where it's at um, you know there's a saying that I mean people that care about you don't need ex excuses and the people that don't care about you won't believe them anyway so why bother I mean you, all you can do is allow yourself the uh, the opportunity uh, to have your own sense of integrity your own sense of dignity based on your own belief systems and if I'm in a situation where I have to be something beyond that um, then I'm, be I'm betraying myself in the process and I can have all that and the people may respond positively because I'm just sort of putting that on the back burner and acting like it's not important and I can definitely play that role for people and, and they're gonna say that they like me they love me whatever but it's sort of a hollow victory because they're only loving the person I'm pretending to be uh, and which the 180 that the person has come to in my opinion is who they really are and now we say who they really are in what sense the life that they're leading the beliefs that are really there um, you know focusing really the life that they had been the direction they were, had been in for most of their life was false mm -hmm. although they had lived it and had caused much, much pain and that abrupt 180 happened here the behavior almost so almost had made that switch out front and that's the logistical edge that I talk about well I mean people change over time uh, you know what we once thought was what I valued the most sometimes um, that was the perception not a reality mm -hmm. or a feeling not a fact mm -hmm. and as we live our life we are able to sort out what are actually facts and what are feelings what are perceptions what's real what isn't real so I mean what we thought was our belief system um, how valid that is is how how enduring it, it becomes and and if we start to see then in a lot of ways I had the perception that this is what I needed to be and who I am but you know as I move forward in that process living my own truth the truth reveals the content of your own integrity you know who I really am um, and that will evolve over time so if you're saying the person 
has come to a point in time in her life where they're thinking just the opposite of what where they once thought as long as it's compatible with what they now know to be their own truth then they're exactly where they need to be but if they're trying to live someone else's expectations and modifying that truth to suit that then they're in trouble I have to clean up some things on the back end because it may be interpreted poorly. Okay. If interpreted poorly, it's going to relay to the person that I'm discussing as their truth must be they really are the first person they were before they made the 180. Well, but only they would What know you that. said may be interpreted this way that, yeah. okay, I guess I am that piece of shit, so I should just stay this track. That's how that may have been interpreted based on what they're facing. Whoa, whoa but that's that's a whole other bunch of variables I, in there. The, it's unfair to you okay. because I can't be specific about yeah. the choices. And for the most part, where does someone, where, how does someone navigate through the moral decision based on a religious value that can add despair and destruction logistically in your earthly life? There's well, only one fucking decision that does that to people. Well, it's it goes back to am I thinking based on what perspective? Mm -hmm. My own, my religious perspective, my spiritual perspective. I mean, mm -hmm. where is my center? Mm -hmm. And uh, if I'm if I'm saying that I'm a piece of shit because of something I did in the past. Or something yeah, I recently did, or something I even in a, a 180 in my life where I it was all going great. Yeah, so I did something and I made that shift. But um, am I okay with that shift, mm. or am I feeling like a piece of shit because of which? Yes. yes, you're okay with it. No, there feel feels like a total piece of shit for the for the the fall, for the choice they made. Yes, okay, which uh, is now. Well, again, what else is going on? There's, there's a lot. I'd have to know more about this to get back. But, but the point is, if that person is judging themselves based on a choice they made, um, and if that choice is a firm foundation of their belief system um, that they violated, um, then either they have to challenge what they believe in the first place, or they have to understand why I made the choice to do the 180. Uh, am I actually rebelling against something that I never endorsed in the first place? Is that why I did this? Or am I doing this in total opposition to everything I believe in? Okay, then, yeah, I'm going to feel lousy about that. But this is the interesting part. They feel lousy about it. Uh, because the choice they made is not compatible with who they are. Mm -hmm. So, um, I mean, the only time we feel bad about a decision if it's I mean if it's based on that deep aspect of violating my own sense of right uh, well yeah then I'm okay I'm still okay because if I'm really the bad person I think I am for having done that it wouldn't bother me hmm. okay that's the whole thing with guilt right as long as I'm doing something and I can recognize that I really feel guilty about that um, it's only because the behavior is not compatible with me uh, so, in other words, it reaffirms. In fact, the worse I feel about it, the more far removed I am from actually being that person. Correct. But if I've turned around and say, wait a minute, I've been living my life based on a certain belief system that, you know, was sort of uh, just mandated that I had to, you know, assimilate into my own, mm -hmm. but it never really felt right. And now all of a sudden I get to a certain point in my life and it's like, no, I don't want to do this anymore because it really isn't compatible with how I understand myself well, to be. I, I explained it from the fact that uh, my, my one word response was respect the process of change. Mm -hmm. Was that that's the process, is that the bad decisions and choices will still resonate. They can, doesn't mean they have to, they can, but it doesn't mean that that's inevitably who you are, right? right. It's, it's like saying just because you made a 180 up here doesn't mean that it happens immediately. Respect the process of change. And that's the part where the guilt is still there. Um, that means they're still okay. It's it's still um, it's lasting. The decision uh, is lasting well, forever. It's sometimes so, it's a choice. What if they didn't make that choice? 
how would they feel about this? And that's when we lean to a different side, the moral side, the spiritual side, which is a beautiful side. So, um, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll discuss it farther off. Um, I, I just wanted to touch on a notion maybe yeah. because uh, I, I know this person's watching and um, I, I, I hate to see people suffer like that mentally uh, in thoughts. And so uh, I said to this person I would try to reach out with, uh, with someone right. I respect and, and well, work it together live. But... Um, yeah, we'll talk more in detail. I, I, you know, I think that's enough with, yeah, with that side. I mean, and that person really needs to work with someone individually on that because there's so many components. And, and that's what we're doing. Yeah. Um, but um, the person respects what we do here mm -hmm. uh, and was okay with what we were doing. So, uh, but I, there's, I, I see there's more information variables that need to be in place, and we can talk later about that. Absolutely. But, um, you know, just circling back to, um, you know, we began talking about um, having fears and connecting and putting on peacock displays and job interviews and really connecting and you know what we, we mentioned about people and how we deal with people that challenge our beliefs you know and I, I just circling back to that is, is trying to keep people to remember that uh, as we walk that fine line of enthusiasm uh, which is stem from competence and as we're uh, helped balanced by humility and we exchange our beliefs with people we we can learn and grow from every different belief and every different thought uh, and for those people that blindly argue on YouTube and exchange their beliefs and on other different chat channels about their own beliefs to be so, uh, I, I just challenge you and respect the fact that, you know, I, I just want to remind them that people have the right to feel how they feel and they have the right to their perception. And there is no reality. And I, I have this argument with people a lot. As there's people that say I'm a realist or I live in reality you're full of fucking shit because there's no reality there's the perception of your reality and the perception of someone else's reality and so the idea that you one may believe that they live in reality is almost a god complex well i mean everyone has i mean your perception is your reality right and that's my yeah, argument. so everyone has a different reality that's right but there's also groupthink okay well, and okay. that's where you get uh the groupthink ISIS. Every, uh, I mean, we could go on. Uh, Republicans, uh, Democrats. Republicans, I Democrats. Mean, there's we, a group yes. think that they they have a a shared reality, and um, and it gives them a sense of being supported to be right. Right. Okay. Oh no, man, you're 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 lighting fires here, man, with this group <laughs> thing notion, man. Yeah. Of, of like, how, I mean, how fucking naive are people that you know that they have to just say, I am this title which encompasses all of these beliefs right you know that you can't think independently yourself mm -hmm. that you know we have to acquire those titles to almost say that yep we believe in this little box and here's my title which tells me that i'm not open for growth and change at all exactly there's no humility and i live in this box of thought be that republican democrat liberal who gives a fuck Wh whatever label you put on it and that right. even applies to mental health man and that that group think shit just Fucks with me, but that's I mean, it's, it's real. It's human. It's how we're wired. It's I mean, human. Humans tend to want to be a part of something, right? I mean, we're pack animals. You know, we want to be a part of that pack. Yeah, the, yeah. The, we all seem to choose a side. Oh no, this side. Oh no, this side. This notion to pick a side. Yeah, I mean, being an individual is a is a rarity anymore. I mean, to actually because no one wants to have that sense of isolation. Sure. You know, they want connections. They sure. Want, and to have connections, I have to find commonalities. And so, and, and that's where people get lost by going. I look at the lifestyle. I want this lifestyle, so I affect my authentic self, change into an unauthentic me because these are my needs to get this lifestyle. Right. Yeah. And now I feel anxious, depressed. I use. I'm mad. I have symptoms of living an unauthentic self. But I'm very competent in getting that lifestyle, thinking now if I get this lifestyle, I I satisfy my needs, only to find that I only satisfy my wants. Mm -hmm. And I mean, with wants, there's always going to be more wants. That's right. Uh, and people lose sight of what they need versus what they want, and they get the too confused. But if this group seems to be very popular, and if I live in a community where oh, everyone's part of this group, well, then either I'm a I'm going to be this iconoclast or something where I step outside the whole picture and say, well, I don't believe in any of that. Well, now I'm isolated. I'm ridiculed. I'm criticized. I'm uh, you know my beliefs are attacked and and most people don't have the wherewithal to really stand up to that. Mm -hmm. uh, it's so much easier to go on 
and all of a sudden now I'm accepted, I'm approved of, I'm liked, I'm loved, uh, you know. So our culture, our society forces us into little categories, into those boxes. Yeah. Uh, Literally, because we check off boxes about who we are and what yeah. we are and yeah. what race we are. Yeah. And that's true. That's right. I mean, like when we vote, we check a box. Hey, I'm in that box. Oh, yeah, that's right. Okay. And, uh, you know, I'm with this tribe. Yeah. I'm with this group. Yeah, I'm blue. I'm red. I mean, what is this? Uh, to be a free thinker, though, uh, you pay a price for that because to a large extent, you make other people nervous. Because what it, I'd rather believe that you can't live outside of a box. You've got to be a part of a box because that's the way we are as human beings. You, you gotta you gotta pick sides here. And if you're not in that box, well, first of all, it makes me nervous because I'd rather believe it's not possible not to be in the box. And you're telling me it is, which you're making me feel inadequate. So I'm gonna attack you for it. That's what happens. And uh, so you, you have to be a pretty competent individual to stand up to that. And um, you know, it's just basically, well, you know, using my cap statement. Well, I'm sorry you feel that way. Mm -hmm. You know, or uh, you know, it's unfortunate you would say that. But if you try to defend it, now you've given them an avenue for their anger, and now you got an argument, and it's not good at all. No, no. and nothing's constructive. No growth. You're just walking around in circles, having this little fight about something that's, you know, it makes no sense in the big picture. But that's how, if you look around our world, our culture we live in, I mean, uh, unfortunately, it's probably worse now than it's ever been. You know, how polarized things are. And there's, there's a, it's absolute. Either you're this or you're that. Gray is not acceptable. You know, even though gray is where growth takes place. Mm. Because gray allows in other ideas and, and other arguments. No one's saying if, you're, if you like that particular box, that you have to give up the beliefs that that reside within it, but to, to be interested in, in what's in other boxes allows you to understand why you do like that box. Mm. If not, I'm basing that on what I'm expected to like as opposed to something that's compatible with who I am. And that's where you lose your individuality and your own integrity. Now you're you're into group think. Mm. I mean, and you know, there's a. a Twitter thing going on that has been on last week or whatever uh, about Ben Affleck and uh, his uh, conversation with uh, I want to say it's Sam Harris uh, on the Bill Maher show um, about criticizing a religion or a group or whether that's possible and this argument and I'm not going to get into it myself I'll butcher it uh, but I would recommend uh, go to Sam Harris um, his Twitter or uh, look up God Saad uh, G A D S A A D um, you'll look up some of those links or the Bill Maher show too uh, and find that Ben Affleck, Sam Harris show. Um, very, very interesting conversations and articles spawning off of this conversation. Uh, I suggest those people look at it uh, and, and look those people up anyway. Um, but it's true. I, I mean that group think it, we begin to designate ourselves like you said and uh, mm -hmm. and if you don't, it devalues them. Right. You know, that's my belief that so yeah. if you cannot believe anything, like you said, then I can? No, that's not true. Um, I, that's challenging. Yeah, either agree with me or you're devaluing me. Yeah. yeah. And which sort of either you agree with me or get the fuck out. Yeah. Or and you're wrong. Either agree with me or be wrong. Right. You know, that's the choices. But I'm not saying that some people that, that live in those boxes, mm -hmm. uh, maybe it is totally compatible with who they are. Right. Yeah, we should clarify yeah, that. There that. are some people that are totally cool with that. Because they are compatible with every single every, thing. They can check off every box. They That's right. Me, and genuinely check it off. Mm -hmm. But other people, the, the people that are on the fringe, that aren't, aren't as uh, extreme in those points, not as you know, the zealous aspects of what that means, uh, those are the people that I really uh, are concerned about because they aren't using that sense of an open-mindedness. You know that that I mean everything is based on uh, what they're intended to think. You know, uh, yeah. That those fringe people are the ones that are held to the fringe by the rhetoric, held to the fringe uh, by all this uh, by the punchlines and the the yeah. limited research and, and the in the two minute yeah. Fox interview of full information, yeah. which is impossible. They're held there by those by those uh, restraints and afraid to go outside of there because mm -hmm. of the negative consequence that could come from family, neighbors, whatever the case is, husbands, wives, yeah. and, and a lot of marriages I've 
bound, you know, um, they, they can either coexist being confident and then where their boxes are, but they respect the other person's and, box. And how pathetic is it that relationships in due to a political difference, that someone isn't intelligent enough or humble enough or allow someone else to have their own thoughts and beliefs that they would sacrifice a chance at love for a political view. I mean, and that happens. I mean, talk about sad. Yeah. I mean, what a waste. Well, I mean... Uh, I, I mean, I'm, I use that as an example of, of how people can be so concrete in the beliefs that they have to a political sense, to an emotional sense, to a, a life sense, a belief, and moral sense enough to where it can nuclear bomb relationships. Absolutely, um, it's it's more common than you know than a lot of people may think. It's it's something though that you can't negotiate. If one person has decided that either you totally sign off on my belief system or we're not compatible, well, the reality is they're right. Because if they have that severe of a dictate, that concrete of a belief, that concrete, then what they're telling you, and if you're not okay with being concrete, well, you probably aren't compatible then. That's true. Okay, so well, it's, thank God. it's not, it's not, uh, but if some people see then, you know, everything changes, uh, you know, whatever that belief is five years later, you know, it, it can, can be, be something completely different. Yeah. And and it flips. You know, what this side is fighting and this side, next time it's the other way around. You know, so if they see it from a longitudinal aspect or, you know, over a long period of time, then it's just an evolution of, of what is the primary thought for that group. So if you allow that, I don't have to agree or disagree. Yeah. Uh, what I need to do is understand. And if both people are trying to under, if that person is really strong in that belief and you care about them, then take the time to, to understand why they find that important yeah. or why that is something that uh, they believe in. And, and you can learn a lot about the person and still maintain a sense of compatibility. A lot of times you can learn to love the differences. Sure. Uh, respect the differences even. Even respect. Utilize the differences. Absolutely. If the differences are known in a relationship and I go, hey, you're better at this than me. Right. You're better at this than me. Then you can build one hell of a team being opposites. Exactly. But what's intolerable is intolerance. I'm sure. Okay. And if you can't tolerate that I may have a different opinion of this, then that becomes an intolerable fault. Mm -hmm. Because basically then um, I don't believe this person respects me. Sure. And, you know, one of the big things in relationship, you know, the intolerables tend to be, I can't trust this person, I'm not respected by this person. Uh, everyone has their intolerables, but if it's one of those and the person is not willing to modify, if not eliminate that aspect, then there's no long-term potential. Agreed. You know, I, I was talking today, uh, you know, I, I believe if you found masters um, in any field or technique or whatever it is they do, people that are uh, excel in something that they do, um, I believe that they would probably tell you that they're as good as they are because of everyone else, that because of their mentors and their teachers and, and their mistakes. You know, they would tell you that in a confidence would tell you, I'm as good as what as I am, as, I'm good at what I do based on those that I've learned from. You know, um, those that understand the idea of mentors and teachers and, and learning and growing, rarely do you find that master of something that goes, I am the best, period, because of me and my attributes and performance. And you, well, it's hard to see those to a point, but well, I mean... Yeah, that would be a, a narcissist. That would be a narcissist, sure. Right. But Well, those you see a lot of. Yeah. But I mean, look at all most political candidates. But yeah. I mean, outside of that, I mean, but the, the truth is, is that opposite of that. Well, I mean, personally, I find... I mean, the, uh, those people ask for help, and that's that... Those are that, that's that fine line of walking the enthusiasm, which we got through the competence to confidence enthusiasm, and that humility from the other side that allows them to be taught, right. be coachable, be learning, you know, at the same time, that, that combination. Yeah, I mean, I mean, everyone's on the shoulders of someone else when it comes to, you know, where they got to where, they're, where they are now. Uh, and even the negatives have, have put you and elevated you above that experience to give you the wisdom that came from it. Right. But... Um, you know, I, I would, I'd like to hope that people can 
actually value people disagreeing because I mean I've learned more things from people who disagree if people think the same way I think I'm not gonna get much growth I'm not gonna get anywhere I mean but I want people to challenge what I think because you know uh, when I know that one thing I know for sure which is that the more you know the more you know you don't know so uh, <laughs> it's true. but I need people to you know actually push up against that and but if I'm not open to hearing it I'm not open to growing yeah and um, so we started this with the understanding of you know how do we find growth it's 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 accepting opposing ideas uh, trying to learn from them and replace parts of your own idea that are now obsolete based on the truths that I've just discovered so I take that piece out and replace it. Now I'm even stronger in what I understand. But if I close myself off to change, then I'm, all, I'm weakening my position in the process because there's other truths that are going to put themselves in front of me that I can't get past simply because I don't understand how to assimilate them into my own belief system. Now I'm locked behind them. I'm, that's the wall. Or in short, so, uncomfortable is where the change is. That's right. In short. Um, it's good chatting, man. No um, but uh, I, th I appreciate you joining me tonight on the Cognitive Rampage. Um, I'll keep answering the emails and stay in touch. Um, I relayed most of the updates and info at the beginning of the show. Uh, we'll see you October 18th. Um, probably, uh, yeah, I'll talk to you one more time uh, next Friday, though, before the show. And uh, also, um, we're thinking about streaming the show live uh, or the event, the talk, uh, Rampage Live. Uh, so I'll let you know probably by next Friday whether that's going to happen or not. But again, Leo, thanks for joining me, brother. No problem. You can find Leo at uh, truthnotemotion.com. Um, his show, uh, he's going to air his show probably in about 20, 30 minutes. Just a little snippet for uh, him. He does little uh, quick lessons. But uh, again, you can find him at truthnotemotion.com. Um, obviously, you know where to find me here at the Cognitive Rampage. Uh, but again, I said it before, please keep the emails coming in. Uh, I'll have some new guests next week probably. Uh, but then again, I always love Leo here. Um, thanks for joining me tonight in the Economy of Rampage, and I'll, uh, I'll see you next Friday.